Hare Krishna Madhavanandru. Hare Krishna Prabhu. The Monks podcast today. It's been a long cherished desire to have you here. In fact, it was our meeting in Puri when we had a discussion in front of some of your students. That actually was the seed of the idea of having this podcast. Because I thought uh-huh. <clears throat> there could be candid discussions between devotees, others can also learn from it. So I'm indebted to you. And you know you are known entire, you know, all over in the devotee world for the Krishna Kathamrud Bindu and the many magazines that you are writing, many the magazines that you publish, as well as the deep devotional research you are doing. I was uh, impressed and inspired by the library that you have made in the Gannath Puri with lots of rare books. So you know I feel that you are an extremely, if I may use that word, extremely rare species of a Devotee has become very scholarly, but most of the devotee scholars are those who have chosen to go into the area of academic academy and then become a scholar over there. But you have stuck to the path of traditional scholarship and been able to carve out a niche for yourself where you are able to do something substantial for the tradition as well as to make the tradition accessible to to devotees in general. So you know, maybe you could tell me, we could start by briefly telling your story of how you gravitate toward, toward the service of going deeply into our traditions, uh, core texts and sharing them. And then we can move forward to discussing the institutionalization of tradition. Well, our, our topic today is my inspiration from my life. Uh, (laughs) And seeing and living in the institutionalization of of, uh, Srila Prabhupada's movement, Mahaprabhu's movement, has inspired me to go in a certain direction. Uh, We're we're living and we're trying to be a a contributing member of Prabhupada's mission, but at the same time we want to be an independent thinker, as Srila Prabhupada wanted which as far as I understand, or as I can see by Shastra and Acharyas, is needed yeah. <laughs> and wanted. <laughs> We're actually supposed to think <laughs> and be individuals <laughs> and create, but it's important for Vaishnavas to be independent. And uh, we can go ahead and start off with, with the point I was thinking of to bring up a little later about our society. Once one devotee, I was telling some devotees just recently, one devotee came to our Guru Maharaj, Bodhavan Maharaj, and he said, Maharaj, I just can't live in the temple anymore. It just drives me crazy in the temple. And Guru Maharaj's response surprised him. Guru Maharaj looked at him and he said, Are Baba, how long will you go on living in kindergarten? So... <laughs> And coming from our Guru Maharaj, who was very dedicated, he was a GBC member, and a very dedicated member of Prabhupada's mission, for him to say something like that, and hearing that story, it stopped me and made me think, you're an educated person, and any educated person knows that every school has an alma mater, and they encourage you to have reunions and to give regular donations to the school and, and to be faithful to the school. But how many schools <laughs> expect that the students are never going to leave the school and they're going to stay in the school for the rest of their life. That's really strange. Now, of course, some of the students will, after they graduate, they'll go on to be managers in the, in the school. Some of them may go on to be teachers in the school. But the vast majority of the students won't be under the control of the institution, that, that school anymore. But they'll take what they've learned And they'll apply it in their own personal life. And at the same time, ideally, generally, we'll see that they have some uh, feeling that they belong. They they, they have some appreciation for that school. And and, and they always go back to the the meetings and whatever, and they support it. But they're no longer the same as a student who's in the school. And that's the traditional system of Gurukul. One of your questions was about institutions in Gaudiya Vaishnavism, which, as you must well know, 
there's been no such thing as institutions in Gaudiya Vaishnavism mm -hmm. in the way that Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta did it. Okay. However, there, there have been institutions in the form of Gurukula. But that Gurukula was, was more the way we're speaking now, that, that something that you, you attend for some years, and then you graduate, and then you're always faithful to your guru, and he calls for you, wants help or something, you go there. But it's not that any brahmachari or student is expected to live in the Gurukula for his whole life, unless perhaps he becomes a teacher assisting his guru or a manager in the Gurukula. Okay, now this is, we are, you are shaking a lot. Of, maybe you were looking for something more personal, I guess. No, I no, no, this is good. Let's go in this direction. So, you know, your, your words are likely to shake a lot of pillars for some of the hearers. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's backtrack. Now, so when you are talking about moving out of comparing to a school, is it specifically living in the temple as a brahmachari is what you're comparing? Or is it uh, affiliation with ISKCON that you're comparing to a, a school? It's what? Yeah. Shiva Prabhupada established ISKCON primarily, I feel, as an educational institution to teach people about the science of bhakti and okay. to facilitate a movement where there's brahmacharis and preachers going out and to give facility in the way of temples for uh, festivals and education and preaching like that. But as far as the, uh, what's the best word to use in this regard? Uh, the kind of control or the kind of guidance, perhaps is a more gentle word, the kind of guidance that we offer to young devotees in the temple who need someone looking over them constantly because even, you know very well of being from Mumbai, or living in Mumbai, it's not that sometimes devotees in the West, they think that everyone in India is completely invaded culture, but there's so many people in Mumbai who are practically the same as New York, or whatever it is that I've seen. And so when they come to the temple, they need someone to help them, to, 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 to solve their doubts, to pacify their anxieties, to show them how to clean themselves after they, they pass and take bath and, and to be regulated and so many things like that. That's important. But bhakti, bhakti is a culmination of all the arts. And for an artist or for a Brahmin to function properly, it's absolutely required that they have to have some independence. Now in our society, that, that may sound uh, disturbing if someone wants to be independent. But we're not speaking about it in a spiritual sense. We're speaking about it in a material sense that devotees, especially Grihasa, should be independent economically. And if someone is a preacher, if someone is an artist, and they're controlled by the temple president or by the, the GBC or something, if they're dictating to that person what to say, and what kind of paintings to make, then where is your creativity? Where is the spontaneity? It, it kills everything. And bhakti, an important aspect of bhakti is spontaneity. We're aspiring for rad bhakti, which is spontaneous bhakti, spontaneous devotion. I would liken a, a, a temple to a university of art. Now you have a school of art, and maybe you have 1,000 students in the school. Out of those 1,000 students, 998 will learn how to be good craftsmen. They'll learn how to make a round circle and how to draw a face and do this and then how to copy some artwork or something. But out of those 1,000 students, maybe two will actually become real artists. And so in the same way, Manushanam Sahasri Shukhashi Gita Kisidaya, that to a, a devotee of, the, of Krishna is a very, very rare thing. So in our temple, I would suggest that out of a thousand persons in the temple, 998 will learn to be religious. And that's very good. They're following Vaidhi Bhakti and that's needed. But what we want is the two persons who are going to become pure devotees. Like that, that's, that's the purpose of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. If we think that our, our, the purpose of our movement is just to collect money, to make buildings, to amass followers, 
then we don't really understand very much about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his movement. Yeah. Yeah. And this last point is perfectly fine. Prabhupada even says in the Bhagavad Gita introduction that if I if I can make one pure devotee, I'll consider my endeavor successful. So that's that's perfectly valid. Now I just want to clarify a few things. So are we talking about uh, grahastas or brahmacharis or both? So because in a sense, grahastas are already to a significant extent independent. They are yes, financially yes. independent, they are socially independent. Mm, and brahmacharis, uh, they are of course dependent. And uh, <clears throat> Unless, of course, they become spiritual masters or something like that, then they or they become very senior devotees, they start their own temple or they start their own organization, something like that. So now you are in a very distinct situation. You are a grahastha, but you are able to write your books and take people on tours. And you could say, if we consider the circle of this is circle of bhakti, you have been able to create a space for yourself where you you give spiritual nourishment. And you are also able to do uh, get some level of uh, financial support through that. Most devotees are not likely to be in that situation. So when we talk about, let's take this in three parts, if I understand right, and you can correct me. See, there is one side is the educational aspect. Mm -hmm. Then second type, second is the applicational aspect. And third is the financial aspect. So as far as education is concerned, most of ISKCON doesn't have any kind of courses that you do and you graduate from them. So in a sense, the satsang, if we consider ISKCON to be like a forum for satsang, then it is a lifelong activity. Then if we consider the applicational aspect, that okay, this is what you should do, this is what you should not do. Then as a movement, if people are staying in the temple, there are certain standards to be expected. Although there is some flexibility now coming up in that also. In my wife. <laughs> and thirdly, if uh, people are, as far as the financial is concerned, then of course, grahasthas and uh, brahmacharis have difference in, and of course, a fourth thing probably could be, which is maybe important for us, intellectual, or like you put it artistic creative or artistic. Mm -hmm. So can maybe, is this classification making sense to you? Because I'm trying to, yeah. Yeah, maybe you could uh, deconstruct what you are saying in uh, more specific terms. Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I, I, uh, maybe I didn't follow all of that so well, but I'm trying now. Um, I think if we consider the matter carefully, okay. if we look at your own life, or here I'm in Mayapur right now, we look at the brahmacharis, but let's use them as an example, because the grahasas, as you pointed out, by nature should be independent. That's a big topic about the independence of the grahasas and, and how they should be independent. I feel mm -hmm. maybe we can come back to that if you're interested. But let's just say something about the brahmacharis. Uh, here in Mayapur, we have that there's a new bhakta program and the new devotees are taken around. I was a new bhakta leader for some years in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I used to take care of, I had a group of little babies who were like my children. And we had a policy in the new Dwarka there that no one was allowed to give instructions to them except the bhakta leader or the temple president because everybody would want to chastise them and tell them, don't eat with that hand, and <laughs> take your shoes off and do this and this. So only the, the bhakta leader could do that. So those persons were like little babies and they needed constant attention. I, I, would, I would sleep in the same ashram with them. I was with them like 24 seven. Mm. They required that. Now, as they progress over the years, as we see here in Mayapur, there's a new bhakta program and there's a bhakta ashram, a brahmacharya ashram, but there's also now a senior brahmacharya ashram. Yes. And that's for devotees who are more or less independent. And as we see here in Mayapur, these brahmacharis, they're maintained by the temple, many of them, and they're doing services for the temples. It's, it's convenient for them, but many of them now are writing books, 
They're doing research, they're giving their own classes. And what they're doing is not dictated or controlled by a leader. Now, I'm not just encouraging that everyone blindly run out and do that. Everything would become chaotic. Mm. Requires, there's some system required. But when someone becomes mature and someone is well-versed in the philosophy, then it, it should be expected that they're going to do something wrong. They should be empowered. Now, maybe they'll stay within the temple their whole life and be an assistant pujari or, or whatever service it is that they do. That's fine. But at a certain point, especially if they're artistic, it's required that they're going to have to go out on their own. We're a little bit friends with Janavi Harrison, mm. and, uh, the, the devotee musician, wonderful devotee. And I've seen in her development over the years, She's been an ISKCON devotee, and she was in the Bhakti Center in New York. And we visited her there. And I, I told her, this was a few years ago, I said, you know, I think at some point you're going to need to be more independent. And now she's practically completely independent. But what she's doing is amazing. She's doing things devotees can't do. We look at the example of, of your Guru Maharaj, Radnath Maharaj, and, and how he's not just giving classes in the ISKCON temples, but he's going to big corporations and different places speaking. And he's completely out of the box from the institution. And I appreciate that because what he does, we use his, him as an example, he's uh, contributing to the institution. He's not just taking from it. When we're younger devotees, we may just be taking from the institution, be like a baby who can't walk and the mother needs to help him. But after some time when we get our legs, and maybe we're a little more mature, then we can do something more for the institution. We can be a little bit independent. And it's actually required for bhakti because uh, bhakti and art have a lot of things in common. Both bhakti and art should be spontaneous. Both bhakti and art should be original. If you're an artist and you copy some other painting, even if it's an expert copy, we don't consider that to be art. We say that's craft. In a similar way, if you, as a devotee, if you follow someone very expertly, you follow exactly Prabhupada's daily schedule, <laughs> you may be religious, but it doesn't mean that you're a pure devotee just because you're doing the physical same things that he's doing. Although I don't know who could actually do the <laughs> sleep for two hours a day like Prabhupada. But mm. it's not just a question of doing his external things. And bhakti, art, art, if you copy someone else's thing, it's not art. Similarly, if I copy the ideas and feelings of someone else, that's not really ultimately bhakti, because bhakti is an expression of the individual soul. And it has to be original. It has to come from the soul. But in our neophyte stage in Vaidhi Bhakti, we, can't, we don't understand that. And if we start trying to imitate that, then the phrase sahajya comes. And there's so many problems come. And such a person may be considered being a drick, as the, the, the uh, 29th chapter, being a drick or a separatist. Okay, the Lord Kapila teaches. Yeah, that's true. When well, he has some separate desire from the Lord. Yeah. Separate desire, and we're not understanding. So we should come to the point where we understand the desire of Guru Krishna. And then as a society, I strongly feel we need to, to give Faith, to, to give trust to those people. I, I, there's, there's four maxims that I see. I mentioned this to you when we had our nice yeah. talk in Puri. You know, four just, just one minute. I, Let yeah. me just uh, yeah. say something about what you said just now, because then you know, we may leave the points behind. What you're saying speaks to my experience also as a writer. There are so many, uh, there are so many devotees who... Uh, tell me sometimes write on this topic, write on this topic. And uh, somehow it's not so easy for me to write a book on any subject just because it is needed and just because somebody tells me to write it. It has to come <laughs> from the heart. <laughs> and unless it, unless it doesn't come from, of course I can take suggestions from others, but unless it connects with something within me, it, it becomes, writing becomes a torture over there. Just can't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I can relate with this. <laughs> yeah. There's and a few people in the room listening to our discussion, and some of them don't know you, 
For those of you who are here in the room don't know, Chaitanya Charanprabhu was a real thinker and he's an artist in his own way in, in writing and, and, and thinking and, and mm. I very much appreciate it. And that's why you've done so well because you, you stimulate thought and, and, and an interest in people. It reminds me of some years ago, we were in one Eastern European country and someone asked me if I'd like to meet a famous devotee artist. And I said, yes, I, I, cause I, I love to meet artists. And so we went to see this artist and she showed us a whole series of paintings that she'd done for a BBT project. And I was looking at all of them, and she asked me, so what do you think of them? And I did something which I generally don't do with artists. With artists, you don't say anything discouraging. You want to just say, oh, it's really nice. But this time I said, well, to tell you the truth, I'm not so inspired by them. And she looked at me and she said, really? I also don't like them. <laughs> she, said, oh, God. she said you know why because they told me what to do and they practically controlled my hand and they said it should be like this and this kind of color and this kind of style and then she said I have some other paintings would you like to see them and I said yeah she said but they're not devotional I said well, I'd like to see them and she brought out this other stack of paintings and I was in ecstasy I, and I told her looking at them they were Paintings of, of Indian villages and a sadhu in a village and, uh, or some old lady in a village or a hand pump or a Tulsi plant and different things like that. And looking at the paintings, which were very, I found very inspiring and, and really spoke to the heart. I suggested to her that if, if no one should criticize you for these kind of paintings if they want to preach about vegetarianism or reincarnation. Because that is further away from bhakti than your paintings. You're in the same way that vegetarianism and reincarnation are things which may encourage people to come to the mode of goodness and come close to thereby to understanding what bhakti is. So her paintings also were like that. <laughs> anyway, let me get back to my four maxims. Oh, that's which I that's a very before. good point. That you know, in certain areas, even in we, even if we go say beyond the devotional ambit, we are quite comfortable with that. But in certain areas, we say, no, no, you shouldn't go in this direction. So vegetarianism. You can't make a, you can't make a painting like that. Everything has to be like Renaissance style. <laughs> That's the way we, you know, that they did it with the BBT, right? But there's so many styles of painting. And we see in the history of Vaishnavism, the Patachitra art in Arisa's Rajasthani art, there's so many different types of paintings. And art is an expression of the heart, which, which moves the heart. It's something, and that's what bhakti is also. Bhakti is meant to move the heart. So, yeah. I, 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 contemplating on Prabhupada's mission and his mood, years ago I was mentioning this in Puri. I yeah. came to the conclusion that Prabhupada had four principles, which are the basis of our movement. And those are, love, trust, responsibility, and empowerment. Hmm. And Prabhupada spoke a lot about love and trust. If you love someone, you trust them. If you want to gain the trust of someone, huh, you have to earn that trust. And then the, the next stage is you have love, trust, then you have responsibility. If I've earned the trust of Gurudev, of Srila Prabhupada, of the devotees, then they'll encourage you as they've done with you. Write books, go and travel and preach, because you gain their respect, you gain their trust. They, they see that. And then they give you responsibility. And the result of responsibility is empowerment. And this is what we want to see for all the members of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement. Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in the beginning of his uh, Harinam Chintamani, he says that this is synonymous with Mahaprabhu's movement, empowerment. He says he spoke through the mouth of Ramananda Roy about Sadhya Sadhana Tattva. He spoke through the mouth of Rupa Goswami and he heard from Rupa Goswami about what is Rasa Tattva. He heard from Haridas Thakur about Nam Tattva. He heard from Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya about Mukti Tattva. And although he's a Supreme Personality of Godhead, he empowered those persons and listened to them. That's the basis of this movement. But if, if our movement is going on and we're just wanting people to stay in kindergarten forever and ever and just do what the authorities tell them, then we're crippling those people. 
How are they going to achieve their full potential in bhakti? And if they as individuals don't achieve their full potential, how will our movement achieve full potential? But to accomplish that, trust is required. And trust is something which I think you're kind of intimating at in an indirect way. Trust is something which has to be earned. <clears throat> so, the, the, this is a, this love, trust, uh, responsibility and empowerment is such a, uh, we could say a human way of looking at the interaction. It is a non-formal personal way of looking at the interaction. Now, taking this forward, see, our, when our movement started, uh, we grew up with certain institutional definitions of success. Say, for example, how many books distributed? I would say three main definitions. How many books distributed? How many temples built? And how many devotees made? So we grew up with those. And to a large extent, individual devotees were seen as human resources for fulfilling the institutional goals. And human resources. <laughs> and down. Go ahead. Sorry? I'm writing it down. I really like that sentence. <laughs> for achieving institutional goals. Yeah. So <laughs> now this is, I would say, not necessarily a bad thing, because you know, not everybody, not everybody has either that need or the ability to be independent. Now, if for some people, okay, they just just do this, and they're happy doing it. And they grow through that. But those who cannot fit in this, uh, quite often, the I, what is considered like what you talk about, you know, the word which I grew up with was whimsical. You know, that if somebody is not following the authority, that person is considered to be whimsical. And to be whimsical is almost as, uh, as bad as being a deviant, as bad as being on the border of, say, blooping out. Yeah. <laughs> so, so then it, the individuals, as they grow, they will some, at least some, especially those who are creative, they will need some space for themselves. And then the challenge would be if, how does the institution give people that space while pursuing its own goals? So maybe you would like to speak something on this Cool, boy. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I'd like to reflect on some of the things you're saying. Uh, I'd like to share with you some thoughts that from a mutual friend of ours, Krishna Abhishek Prabhu, hmm. uh, who's a scholar, PhD from uh, Chicago, University of Chicago, who did his thesis, as you may know, in, uh, I think, in Hinduism, and particularly on, on Thakur Bhaktivinoda, yes. Hindu studies in Thakur Bhaktivinoda. And as part of his research, he's a native Bengali speaker, from Kolkata, he uh, had somehow got access to letters exchanged between Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and his younger brother, Lalit Prasad Thakur. Okay. And when I heard that, I became very curious because maybe some of the persons who are listening to this don't know about Lalit Prasad Thakur. I should say a few words. In ISKCON, we don't really know much about him. We don't say much. But within the Gaudiya Mutt, he's considered to be something of a, a bad personality. Like there was some problem between him and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta. They treat him like a demon or something. Srila Prabhupada went to Birnagar, uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur Sripat here in West Bengal. And he met with, with Bali Prasad and they were going to help take care of that project. That's a whole nother different topic. But anyway, when I heard from Krishna Abhishek, that he'd studied some of the correspondence between these two brothers, I immediately asked him, I said, I'd like to know what was the problem? What was the controversy between the two? And this has great relevance to our discussion in the same moment. And he laughed. And the first thing he said was, he said, the, the, my immediate impression was I was surprised because I was also expecting some big controversy, but they were so loving and so affectionate. I said, okay, so then what was the difference? And he said, the difference of opinion was a very simple one. 
The Shiloh Bhante Siddhanta Saraswati uh, was putting forward a system of preaching and propagating Krishna consciousness, which was based on a template of the, of the Ram Krishna mission with temples and brahmacharis and printing books and sannyasis and people going out and doing harinam and preaching and like that. Whereas the Lipa Santaka was saying, no, 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 no. That's not the best way to practice bhakti. Bhakti should be done at home on an individual level. And later Krishna, Krishna Abhishek recently told me that one of the last instructions the Lipa Sad gave to one of his senior disciples was, after I pass away, don't build a temple. <laughs> don't build a temple. It'll spoil don't, everything. Don't build a temple for me? Or what? At the Birnagar. At the Birnagar project, don't build a temple. But with, the devotees should come together every day for Krishna Kata and Kirtan and like that. But don't make a big formal structure like that. Now, I'm not going to suggest that, that uh, what Shiva Bhakti Siddhanta did was wrong, Hare Krishna. I couldn't say that, and that's our life and soul. But I wouldn't suggest either that the leap of Sartaka was wrong either. And I think there's something relevant for both of them. We have a series of talks we've given sometimes. We coined a phrase, we call it living alone in the crowd. Living and alone and proud. Living alone in the crowd. The crowd, okay. And that, that's the short answer to your question that we need to learn to live alone in the crowd. And for me, I feel this is one of the essential qualities that we can learn from Mahaprabhu's pastimes in the Gambira in Jagannath Puri. As you may have heard me speak before, we consider that Jagannath Puri is like the Jagannath Puri University of Braj Prane. It's like a school. In each different Tirtha Stali, is a different classroom with a different lesson to teach us how to go to Vrindavan. Because the Mahaprabhu's purpose was to go to Vrindavan. And in Puri, he's showing us how to do bhajan to go to Vrindavan. So each is a lesson we see in each different place, and sometimes more than one lesson. In the Jagannath Mandir, which is the first classroom in Puri, the lesson there is, that, is about organized religion. And it's a little bit of an unpalatable uh, teaching because whether we like it or not, God always supports organized religion. Even though Haridas Thakur can't go inside the temple, even though Rupa and Sanatana can't go inside the temple, and even though there's so many smart Brahmins there who are spoiling the mood of things, still Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't argue with them. He didn't insist that Haridas Thakur would be allowed inside the temple. He, co he cooperated with organized religion. And in fact, Srila Lochandas Thakur, in his uh, Chaitanya Mangal, he states there that Mahaprabhu was going three times a day to the Jagannath Mandir. Mm. But at the same time, in Puri, there's another classroom which is not far from the Jagannath Mandir, and which has a very, very different sort of teaching. Uh, and that is the Gambira. And by that, Mahaprabhu is teaching us that we should support organized religion, but we need to have a Gambira. We need to have a quiet place where we can be creative, where we can be individual, where we can associate with like-minded persons with two or three associates, like, like in Sruptamadar and Roy Ramananda in the Gambira, and we can express our inner feelings if we want to advance properly in bhakti. And I would even go so far as to say, if we want to propagate this movement properly, because if we only just propagate the Jagannath Puri temple side of things, then the artists and intellectuals who come, the people who feel a strong need for individualism, or the mature devotees who become more individual, because that's what happens when we practice bhakti, we become more and more individuals as we progress. Then those devotees will become discouraged, and they'll think everything is just so rigid and so institutional, and there's no spontaneity, and I can't think for myself, and, and, and they become discouraged and they go away. 
So we need to have both things in our society. And this is one of the big purposes of our project, Gopal Ji Publications, to facilitate my Guru Maharaj's kind of preaching like this. He wanted to preach to the devotees. We want to do yatras and puri where we take devotees away and there's no temple president, there's no GBC for one week. And you just do bhajan and you sit in front of the deities of Toto Gopinath, wherever, and you have long kata for two or three hours. And it's individual and it's very personal. And we want to do this with our magazine. We want to do this with our research. We want to do this with our ashram, as we were telling you when you came to Puri, where we can have wonderful guests like yourself there. And we can have a, a core group of devotees who are like family. And it's not such an institutional kind of atmosphere because these are devotees who have earned our trust and who have shown that they're mature and we're not babying them anymore. We're not, you know, getting on their case because they came late from Mongolartik or this or that. We, we understand and respect them. And everybody in such a community, and community is a big word for me, community is what I feel that our society needs to be going towards instead of institutionalism. We should be going toward community. And community means that each individual is contributing some original artistic offering. They're contributing something in the community. And then everybody's so excited and they're all working together and everybody's becoming empowered and the movement becomes very powerful. That's my hope and vision for this society. <laughs> That's beautiful, Mr. Prabhu. And in some ways, this is, uh, this is going to resonate a lot with uh, the younger generation. Because one of, I think one of the biggest challenges for our movement is that uh, those who have grown up in our movement don't want to associate too closely with it, many of them. The, either the Gurukul children or the, even many devotee children, they would like to keep a little arm's distance. So just going back to this, uh, now I have talked with like, like I haven't traveled as much as you, but the last five, six years I've been traveling uh, across the world. And I, most of the time when I travel, I stay with Grahastha devotees. Then I see their life and uh, they are, I, I would say they are as committed to bhakti as I see the best of brahmacharis, though they may not be going to the temple so much. So now the challenge comes up that, uh, our institutional expectations, see there are, I would say three different kinds of expectations. One is the sadhana itself. The sadhana itself, say chanting 16 rounds and that itself takes a significant amount of time. And the sadhana, then also there are services in the temple, which you are expected to do, not just go to the temple, but a serious devotee is expected to help in the temple services. And beyond that, there is the devotee socializing. So in the devotee community. Now, part of it is spiritual, part of it is simply human, part of it could be, could be gossiping. We, we can't avoid the entire human element. But with so many things going on, and of course nowadays, most of our devotees live in cities where the jobs are quite demanding, the lifestyle is very fast. So, uh, with all this, where is the time actually for individual development? And uh, so is it that uh, sometimes we may have to uh, de-emphasize the institutional goals? Or from a traditional perspective, before I go ahead, that uh, how important are these three institutional goals which I mentioned? Building temples, distributing books, making devotees. Uh, do we have any precedents for this in the tradition? Mm. Yes, we do. It's called Guru Seva. And that's, that's the life and soul of the devotee. I often, like you, when I travel, I meet so many different devotees. And sometimes we meet devotees who have had a bad experience with the society or have a, they've gotten a bad opinion about ISKCON for whatever reason. And I find it helpful. I, I've tried to understand their perspective and I find it helpful to frame ISKCON in a certain way. I describe it as Srila Prabhupada's Seva Sangha. 
seva sangha beautiful instead of thinking of it as an institution in a bureau, bureaucratic order so it's the seva sangha and that's why i'm present you know, because i want to do that seva sangha so these three aspects that you mention are sadhana our services and in the the sangha or the social part of the devotees all three of these we can see have a certain um, scope for neophyte devotees and they have another scope for devotees who are more mature now what does it mean to be a neophyte devotee as you well know it's not just how long you've been in the temple but it's how much faith you have in bhakti it's how how how, how strong you are as an individual how which is a reflection of your faith mm -hmm. So if someone doesn't have very strong faith, if they're not a very strong individual, then they really need a crutch. One sadhu in Vrindavan once told me, he said, Madhavananda, he said, the temple, uh, being in the temple, it's like living in the temple is like water holding up the boat of your sadhana. It's very good because you live in the temple. If you don't go to Mangalarti, maybe they won't give you prasad. <laughs> if you don't chant your 16 rounds, they'll kick you out of the temple like that. So you have to chant your 16 rounds. You have to do your seven. So that temple is like a boat holding up, water holding up the boat of your seven. He said, but what happens if you start taking the water and pouring it in your boat? In other words, you start mixing up what is, what is my personal seven with the institution and we start considering it to be the same, then your sadhana may sink, your, the body of your sadhana, because it's no longer your personal expression. Because our bhakti, our, our, our devotional activities, should be like our art, just like a painter or a musician or someone. Our, our art is expressed in the way we do our individual puja, and in the way that we give class, and the way that we write, and the way that we cook, and the way that we lead kirtan, and whatever it is that we're doing, that's the individual is the artistic expression, and that's needed. So for a neophyte devotee, because they're not mature enough, they don't have confidence in themselves, they're just being told what to do, they just have a plain vanilla sadhana, they don't read Manasiksha every day, or Upadeshamrita, or whatever it may be, they just have a plain simple sadhana, and that's good. But as they become more mature, they'll want something more. Similarly with the services, in the beginning, we just do whatever we're told. Jayananda Prabhu was a very surrendered devotee. He just did whatever he was told. But at a certain point, he started having individual inspiration to put on Rathiatra festivals. And he was engaging people who are drunkards and different things and acting in a very unorthodox way compared to most of the devotees in the temple. And the third category you mentioned about our devotee Sangha, which is social life and things, Again, that's going to differ. In the, in the, I find a lot of uh, younger devotees, when they come together, some, even I once saw a book that said, when you have this kind of meeting, the first thing you do is you have an icebreaker. And you go around the room and you ask everybody what their name is. Then you make a joke. And then you, you read from Bhagavad Gita. And then we all chant one round of japa all together. And when I hear that, it sounds very mechanical and very painful. But I understand that for some new devotees, that may be ecstatic. And that, that may be really, really nourishing and nice for them. Because they don't have their own individual desires or, or spiritual desires or uh, ability to express themselves yet. But when they become a little more mature and we can trust them, they've earned the trust. They've shown, they understand the siddhanta. They've shown they're dedicated to Shiva Prabhupada then it's natural they're going to want something a little more. They're going to need the Gambira. And let's remember, I'll just make this final point, I'm sure you have some reflections on this. Let's remember that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement began behind closed doors in Srivasanga, with a small group, and it ended behind closed doors in the Gambira with just a few persons. It's not wrong to, to be with small groups of devotees. It's necessary to nourish our own individual bhakti. And there's a, there's a, there's a statement from Srila Prabhupada I wanted to share in that regard. 
It's uh, Srila Prabhupada's letter to Karandar, a very famous letter, 22nd December, 1972. And he began speaking about how, instructing him, just to paraphrase what he's saying, don't centralize anything. Each temple must remain independent and self-sufficient. That was my plan from the very beginning. Why are you thinking otherwise? And he said, don't think about this big corporation, centralization. These are all nonsense proposals. The only thing I wanted was that book printing and distribution should be centralized. Therefore, I appointed you and some other devotees to do that. Otherwise, management should all be done locally by local men. And then there's a sentence from Srila Prabhupada, which is one of our Mahavakyas. He says, the Krishna consciousness movement is meant for training men, I think in women also, to be independently thoughtful and competent and all types of departments of knowledge and action, not for making bureaucracy. This is the purpose of the Krishna Gansas movement, for training men to be independently thoughtful and competent. Wow. <laughs> and probably later on, he says also, uh, even if someone is mechanically following, gradually from the class, they'll come to the point of spontaneous enthusiasm. The spontaneous loving devotional service is not such an easy matter. But if one simply strict, stick, sticks strictly to the rules and regulations, like rising early, chanting 16 rounds, chanting Gayatri, always keeping clean, then his enthusiasm will grow more and more. And if there's also patience and determination, one day he will come to the platform of spontaneous devotion. Mm. Beautiful. So... It's Prabhupada is talking about in some way Utsaha and Dhairya over there. Utsaha Nishya Dhairyad. Yeah. Thank you for sharing this. So now this uh, is an aspect of Srila Prabhupada that is usually not highlighted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why not? There, there's a reason why it's not. Because many devotees are not mature enough. Honestly. Okay. If you, if you, you encourage everybody to be independent and thoughtful, then they're going to say, well, the heck with you. I, I'm not going to. And then how will the temple go on? How will the book distribution go on? There needs to be some, some management and some, some control like that is needed, especially for younger devotees. Mm -hmm. And mature devotees should understand and appreciate the need for it. So what you're saying is two distinct things that in the senior, like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had his own space, but he, he didn't oppose the Jagannath Puri temple. So we he could not, not, only, not only he did not oppose it, he supported it. Okay. He, yeah, he himself visited it and everywhere supported. Yeah, that's true. So in that sense, mature devotees or those who are artistic or mature, they need to carve out a space for themselves, but do it in a way that is supportive of the movement. Supportive of the institution or the local temple. I remember one senior Prabhupada disciple, they told me that, that you know, there is inside is con, there is outside is con, and there is besides is con. So besides is con means you, know, you, you have your own space and then you contribute. But there you can do something yourself. Hmm. So going back to this point of what Prabhupada says in this letter, then in general, the every institution needs certain parameters to see how it is progressing, how it is growing. And often individual spiritual growth is, is quite difficult to, difficult to quantify. So, you know, if there is, if there is a temple, now the temple sets some goals for itself. The temple said that we will distribute this many books or we will have this many programs. We will raise funds for this particular project. And then the whole community gets involved in that. Now, some devotees are able to find their own individuality within the institutional goals. Some devotees may flourish as say fundraisers. Some devotees may be able to flourish as, uh, as project leaders for a particular projects, but some devotees may not. So then when somebody wants to have that space, where does the initiative begin from? 
Is it that the devotee has to take a stand? This is what I'm going to do. Or is it that the leaders, uh, leaders have to recognize that we have to give space for this people. So where, where do you think this kind of change can begin? So Great question in Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's movement, it doesn't become, doesn't begin outside. It begins inside. It doesn't begin by building temples or, or formal type of rules and things, but it begins with our own personal bhajan. It begins with what my grandma used to call Atma Krandana, or the crying of the soul. Okay. When we're crying out for Krishna, that we want association with like-minded devotees, we're crying out to Krishna that I want something deeper, I want something more substantial. That's where it begins. Okay. It's the only place it can begin. <laughs> if we try to begin from the outside, it's, it's just going to stay outside. <laughs> so then this could, some, there could be some growth pains in this, isn't it? That a devotee feels uh, maybe suffocated within the institutionally instructed services. And then somehow, as you said, one wants to serve Krishna, but one can't, one doesn't feel inspired to serve Krishna in the way one is told to. Then gradually, one moves towards creating that space. So, I'm, I really appreciate you of how uh, you are able to, in a sense, transcend the individual institutional conflict by focusing on the point of the heart. And once there is a calling in the heart, then things will move forward naturally. So, Going back to the earlier point of say Lalit Prasad and Bhakti, and Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur, um, we do see that what Bhakti Sanskrit Thakur created, the Gaudiya Mutt, it spread, he had 64 centers in India and three across the world. Now Lalit Prasad, his spiritual advancement notwithstanding, didn't leave that kind of legacy. So isn't some amount of centralization uh, essential if a movement is to spread substantially if we consider say uh, the Catholic Church as contrasted with Protestants now Protestants from the last I read there are almost 55,000 Protestant denominations and they keep separating the Catholic Church of course has had some horrendous uh, scandals like child abuse child sexual abuse and other things but still they have also they have like an enduring historical legacies there. They have a prominent, uh, prominent presence in the world. So, so for, a, for outreach to be substantial, isn't centralization also required? I would totally agree with that. That was Srila Bhaktisiddhanta's vision and his purpose for, for creating an institution is a vehicle, but we compare it to a box. If, if someone brings a gift to you and the gift is inside a beautiful box and you get the box and you say, it's such a wonderful box. And you look at the box and you hold it up to the light, but you never open it. And you just glorify the box. Mm. Wouldn't it be a little ridiculous? We should open up the box and see what is the gift inside. The institution is just the external box. At one point, it was called the Gaudiya Mission. Another time, it was called the Gaudiya Mutt. Another time, it was called the League of Devotees by Srila Prabhupada. And then later, Prabhupada gave it the name ISKCON. Those are just different boxes. But the gift inside is the gift of bhakti. And that's what we have to find. If we're just preoccupied with the box, and the box is important. We, the box is there to help keep things in order. And we want to take care of the box. But we want to take care of the box because of what's in it. Not just that we're preoccupied with the box itself. And, and we think that the box is the gift. That becomes problematic. So what are you com exactly comparing the box to? The, the box is the institution. And the gift inside is bhakti. So you can say the institution is the means by which Bhakti can be spread far and wide. So like yes. if, you, if you have to give something precious, if it's not properly packed, like say we get a gift from Amazon, if you get some purchase something from Amazon, it has to have good protective packaging. 
and the protective packaging will ensure that it goes far it goes far yes so so without an institutional structure we cannot spread but it's important that we recognize that spreading the institution itself is not our purpose it is spreading what the institution is offering yes yeah. and we have to open the box ourselves and, and, and eat what's inside take part of what's inside i i in this regard what you were mentioning before about the dilemma which is common in our society for thinkers and artists when they come and they feel some they feel like they're being stifled sometimes if you look at the history of our society it's very interesting in the 60s and 70s Srila Prabhupada when these very strong individuals american devotees were coming and they would they would be in a temple for two weeks or two months Prabhupada would oftentimes send them out to open their own center they'd be a devotee literally sometimes for two weeks and Prabhupada would send them out to open up their own center and by having their own center if you see if you look at the uh, direction of management the Prabhupada wrote a very interesting document Prabhupada wanted those centers to be autonomous and to be independent of the GBC in the sense that the temple president and the local leader was the inspiration for the group. And the GBC, their job was just to make sure that everybody was chanting 16 rounds and, and distributing books and like that, but not try to micromanage things and not try to, to get involved with the, the mood of things. In India, we see a reflection of this and also in Vaishnavism. Like, like in Arissa, there are many different villages. There's Brahmin Sassans. There's Brahmin villages. There's villages of artists. There's villages of people who make brass pots and things. And those people more or less think alike, and they congregate together, and then they work together usually. And in a similar way, Srila Prabhupada encouraged the devotees. He told Jamuna, yes, you should open some center up for the ladies. He, he told Satsurup Maharaj in one letter, he said, yes, the, the black body devotees, they can have their own center for black body persons, and we can have any different Prabhupada centers. said that? Yeah. Oh, it's a letter like that. <laughs> oh. So this is remarkable. Because I, when I was in New York, I visited a very very popular uh, Christian church. And I was observing, you know, how they do things. So they Andy have, Stanley? sorry? Andy Stanley? Yeah. Anyway. So, okay. So, <laughs> so what I noticed is many of these churches, like they have three distinct services. One for say wasps for white Americans, another for blacks, another for Latinos. And then the mu music is different over there. The food is different. Of course, the, the, either the language is itself different or at least the way the pastor speaks is different. You know, each group has its own uh, individual, individual culture. So in a sense, what they do is they customize their Christianity uh, to harmonize with the culture of the group that is coming over there. To some extent so well, another, way you might, another way you might put it is that those individuals the leaders within the different groups you're mentioning when they become more empowered and understand Christianity they have their individual expression of Christianity which resonates with people who come from a similar psychophysical background of themselves yeah you know I like that how what <laughs> what could be phrased as a institutional strategy, which sounds so very cold and calculative, that could also, <laughs> that could also be phrased as an as a expression of individual autonomy. So it just, we don't know how it is, but that's nice, yeah. So, so it's significant that uh, Prabhupada also recommended this, that because I, I sometimes feel that we as in a devotee community, a lot of effort goes in trying to resolve conflicts. And one reason for that is, I think we are trying to impose too much control. And so it's uh, maybe just giving us some autonomy, like uh, what, what you said, when during Prabhupada's time, if two devotees had, couldn't get along, Prabhupada would just tell both of them, go to different places and start temples. Start your own center over there. So in a sense, giving more individual space for individuality could actually also de decrease 
institutional conflicts, isn't it? Yes, and it creates community because community, let's use a Sanskrit word, which we may be more comfortable with. Community sounds like a new age word, Sangha. Sangha, yes. We want to create Sangha. Sangha means community. We want to create a very intimate Sangha of devotees, which is based on Krishna Katana and based on like-minded devotees. When we have a Sangha which is based on, I, I bought, some, bought a flat here in this place, and because you also bought a flat, then therefore we're communities because we bought something in the same place, or because we joined in the same temple, and we have to maintain this temple. And that's the, that's the, the unity of our Sangha. That may be weak, but if the unity of the Sangha is there because we, we both love a certain preacher, we both love a certain vision that he has. Maybe that person is Bhakti Tirtha Maharaj and he has a certain kind of Sangha there or, or my Guru Maharaj or your Guru Maharaj or whoever. We, we're inspired by a certain person's vision and then we come together and that's, that can be very, very sweet. And we can love the devotees more, we can interact with them more and it becomes less controlling. You were saying. Let me, let me read you another something from Prabhupada's letter to Karandar. It's, it's really powerful. Let's see here. He says, uh, we should be careful not to kill the spirit of enthusiastic service, which is individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. Yeah. I remember <laughs> I was giving a lecture in, in the Gambira with the Vaisheshi Prabhu's group. And I read this letter and they all became really ecstatic. And he said, this is ISV, individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. That's their, they, they called the ISV. And it was based on this letter, he said. And Prabhupada goes on, let me read a couple more sentences. He said, that is the art of management to draw out spontaneous loving spirit of sacrificing some energy for Krishna. Krishna conscious movement must always be a challenge a great achievement to be gained by voluntary desire to do it, and that will keep it healthy. So you big managers now, you uh, try to train up more and more competent preachers and managers like yourself, but forget the centralizing and bureaucracy. <laughs> Beautiful. It's one of my favorite letters from <laughs> Yeah. It's a, so when you talk about about individual expression, like I earlier mentioned about say, the Protestant uh, splitting endlessly based on their own ideas of how they should approach, they accept Jesus as the savior, but they keep splitting. So I'm now going to the other side. We acknowledge the necessity for individuality, but at the same time, there has to be, if we are a part of a movement, part of a tradition, there has to be certain level of conformity. So, uh, where do we draw the limits? Say, I'll give some examples uh, for, you know, say for example, you know, I, um, I have certain intellectual needs. So you know, I bond with devotees who have similar intellectual needs. So for example, I used to read Western authors, you know, Western literature. I used to like that. And uh, now I know some devotees who also like that. There are some devotees I know who were from a nationalist background previously. Uh, so they were, and then they came and they just rejected the nationalism and they started practicing bhakti. But now they feel that you know, they would like to do something uh, more for raising, say, the broad consciousness of dharma within India, not so much directly they sometimes feel that sharing Krishna consciousness is too elevated for most people. And people, people may sometimes, uh, we may get a few number of people over there, but most people maybe are becoming atheistic, they are becoming leftist, they are getting converted to Christianity and they become hostile to Sanatan Dharma. So they want to do something at that level. Now some devotees may start uh, doing outreach, say by giving motivational talks where there is not much Krishna consciousness in it. And they may get a lot of success over there. Some devotees may do more humanitarian work where we feed the poor and things like that. So now this, 
Now, sometimes these kind of devotees they receive a lot of criticism because they they say you're you're not you're doing something which Rabupa did not do. You're not you're not actually sharing devotional service. So this the question I'm making is that can if somebody's life is devoted to Krishna, but the way they are expressing themselves may not be directly connecting people with Krishna, or, then where do we draw the limits for individual expression, or we really can't draw the limits? Well, the first thing I, I think we really it's a very sober statement, but we need to understand we don't own people. The people who come to this movement, they come in here and we're, we're, we're guardians, we're, we're people who are here to preserve and try to pass on something we've gotten from Srila Prabhupada. That gift doesn't belong to us, it's Prabhupada's gift, Mahaprabhu's gift. And those people who come, they also don't belong to us. Just as any parent understands at a certain point, the children have to leave the nest. They're going to have to, we're going to have to let them make their own mistakes and things. We need to empower people. I, I'll tell you a short story in this regard. I, some years ago, quite often, devotees bring people to Puri, asking us to take them on Purikrama. And some years ago, one of the schools came from Mayapur. It was a girls' school. And there were a bunch of young girls, like, I don't know, from the ages of seven or eight to maybe 12. And we went to the temple of Tota Gopinath, and we gave a talk, and it worked out good. The girls liked it, I could see. And afterwards, we're walking together on the road, and one of the girls was looking at me with this kind of admiring kind of look, and she says, Prabhuji, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. And I stopped, and I said, no. And they were all a little shocked, and I said, you should be better than me, because you all come from a better background than I come from. And I'll never forget the look on that little girl's face when I said that. And all of a sudden her back became straight. And this is what we want for this movement. We want to empower people. Otherwise, who wants to join this movement? It's a fact that, that we do need conformity. We need conformity because there's a lot of people who want conformity. There's a lot of people who want to be told what to think and what to do, and that's okay. There's no harm in that. And they can practice bhakti and they can become exalted personalities and we love them. I, Prabhupada, he said we should have, uh, what is it, um, the phrase, famous phrase. Um, oh gosh. Philosophical speculation versus mental speculation. Unity, unity and diversity. Unity and diversity, okay. And so you're mentioning this fact that there's so many devotees who are going to have different expressions. Now I can go and I can criticize someone who wants to build a hospital. And I can say, what in the world do you want to do that for? You should focus on pure bhakti. But maybe that person wants to create a hospital because he's a doctor and he doesn't want to work in a non-vegetarian hospital. And he has some inspiration. He feels if I have a hospital, then I can, I can expose outside people to bhakti in this way. Let him have his expression. And someone else wants to distribute free food, prasadam. Someone else wants to preach about the mode of goodness and health. So I have no problem with those things. As a society, though, what is our unity and diversity? That's, that's all, those are all expressions of diversity. But where is the unity? The unity has to be there in our kirtan and on our Krishna kata. And our focus when we come together on Sudha Bhakti. It's not that when, we, when we're outside, maybe we speak about vegetarianism and we give a great class about that. And we can inspire people to give up eating meat and that helps them come to the mode of goodness and it's so nice in so many ways. But when I go to the temple in Chopati or, or Juhu or someplace, it's not that I should give a lecture to the brahmacharis there that you should all quit eating eggs and fish and be vegetarian. That's insulting. Rather, the, one of the, the six... Uh, elements which are necessary to nourish bhakti in our exchanges is guya makyati prichati. We should have some confidential exchange. It's very, very important. And if we think about that, that's the, that's the idea of art. Art means something confidential. It's from my heart. And, and I'm expressing this thing in a way that can touch your heart. And that's something confidential and amazing. That's bhakti. And, and, and we should, it should be astonishing. It should be chamatkar. 
Chamakar Chandrika, right? Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur describes. There should be something astonishing about bhakti. And that is how we should come together as devotees. So some devotees will feel some inspiration to preach in a kind of a nationalistic way. And why not? There's some people who relate to that. As we, we've been discussing something from the 10th verse in the 29th chapter of the third canto for the last four or five class sessions we've had, it speaks about bhakti and the mode of goodness. Mm. In Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur in his Sartha Darshani, he says the symptom of someone who's practicing the sattika bhakti, which is saguna bhakti, it's bhakti in the modes of material nature. One of those symptoms is they can't distinguish between their duties of dharma, of varnashram dharma, varna and ashram. They can't distinguish that between bhakti. They think that they, the two overlap and they think the two are the, basically the same thing. That's the symptom of mundane bhakti in the mode of goodness. We don't want that. But at the same time, someone as a preacher, they may be on the platform of nirguna bhakti, free from the modes of material nature, mm. and they're practicing pure bhakti, but they may put it in a particular box, the box of nationalism, or the box of a devotee hospital, or the box of, of feeding the poor, or the box of this or that. But if, if inside the gift is there, pure bhakti, if the motivation is pure bhakti, and, it, and they're ultimately giving that to people, not because as Bhakti Vigyan Maharaj once commented to me, in Russia, he said, there's a lot of bridge preachers. Bridge preaching means you go from one side of a river to the other side. Yeah. Uh, on this side, we have people interested in bhakti. And we go to the other side where they're interested in astrology or yeah. vegetarianism or health or something. And so that's good. We go over and we meet them. But the problem is if we stay on the other side and we don't come back. <laughs> well, the problem is we start speaking about astrology or health or this or that. And we don't speak to them about bhakti. And then people come because they like astrology, not because they like bhakti. In this regard, uh, the Bhakti Center in New York, I think, is a shining example. They have classes in Ayurvedic cooking. They have classes in, in, in Vedic management. They have classes in Hatha Yoga. But the whole thing is being done by the Hare Krishnas. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows that. And they make friends with the people. And after they've been coming, taking Hatha Yoga or whatever, maybe it's only Hatha Yoga, no preaching, for a few months or something or a few weeks, they, they make friends and they say, hey, you know, you should come to our Thursday night kirtan program. <laughs> mm. and they go there and they're finished. <laughs> An amazing, wonderful kirtan program. That to me is a shining example of how we can do this and how we can have unity and diversity. We have the diversity where some people preach through, through nationalism, some people preach through yoga, this or that. But we have the unity and the sense of pure bhakti. That's beautiful. I think, Prabhu, uh, we will need more sessions to discuss this because there's a lot more to discuss. I would be delighted to do that. Yeah. So maybe I will uh, we'll, we'll conclude. We will, I'll summarize this. Uh, what you said, we'll conclude this thread. And let me just give a, a little. Let me just give a little pitch for something we've done before. You're a writer; you understand this. We made a magazine some years ago called uh, Putana: False Gurus, Institutions, and the Holy Name. And I wrote a long article, which kind of the, the in invisible letters, the invisible title is "Why I'm Still Here in the Society." <laughs> by, the, <laughs> by the same title, of Putana: False Gurus, Institutions, and the Holy Name. And uh, there's a lot of extensive thought and quotes from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta from his article about Putana and different things about institutions in that magazine. That's okay. my little pitch. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you. <laughs> so is this magazine article available online or maybe we could put that in the description? Yeah, I haven't put it online, but, I, but I've been thinking I should do so. And yeah, yeah, maybe we could, yeah, maybe we could put it in the YouTube description here so that devotees can go to the link and read it also if they need okay. it. So just reflecting on the last point that you mentioned about uh, the bridge. So if devotees feel inspired, I like that point, as you said, a profound point, we don't own devotees. And even if somebody is a brahmachari in the temple and they are, even if they are in the temple, still they are individuals on their own and they are here voluntarily. So if somebody is inspired to serve in a particular way, and as you said, they are framing 
the message for elevating people's consciousness through a particular box and uh, the in the heart one's inspiration should be coming from krishna but the challenge is that what happens if we build a bridge so normally the number of people who will cross the bridge and come over is is not much there'll be a small number say if you compare to the bhakti center the people who are interested in say physical yoga or astrology or ayurveda are naturally <laughs> going to be much more than the number of people yes. who are interested in bhakti so now the the opportunity is that there are some people who are there in that circle who will come to bhakti if they get connected with devotees and if they if that if devotees are not in that field then they would go to some other astrologer who will just give us some astrology or ayurveda or yoga where they will not get anything else more so they so i was talking with uh, my guru maharaj anath maharaj and he said that rather than he said what we need to see is that whatever a devotee is doing like whether it is yoga or whether it is ayurveda basically it is an opportunity for people to associate with devotees and it is through that association that the spiritual journey will begin so about the bhakti center one thing i have seen is their model i have also been quite inspired that the model is very non intrusive somebody could just come and do yoga and leave and they they are not pressurized but they just get such a sweet experience over there that they want more of it and as you say the kirtans are brilliant over there so people just get <laughs> dramatically lifted so then if we take the bhakti center example what we could say is that a devotee while expressing one's individuality in a particular way to reach a particular set of people there should also be some mechanism by which people can come forward when they want to in the bhakti center has that if this is all you want fine take it but if you want more we have this here so in that sense if i am not mistaken in bhakti sanasri thakur also had a i think like a ashram for people who were suffering from leprosy and things like that isn't it so it's not yes. unprecedented Mm-hmm. Yeah, we we always have to bear in mind what our goal is. Our goal is for people to become individuals and to develop bhakti. And regimentation is not bhakti. Some regimentation is required for new people. They march in unison and things. And we may preach through yoga and whatever. And I quite agree with your assessment that the vast majority of people who come and take those yoga classes, they may not. become devotees but they may say you know i i becoming a hari krishna that's a little too weird but those people are really nice if they come to that point if they just say but i really like those hari krishna people and they have good food <laughs> then it, it's not just we shouldn't just see externally that they're liking yoga their consciousness is at a certain is not developed enough yet where they can begin to practice bhakti but if they come to the point where they can begin to appreciate the devotees that's an amazing thing can i quote a couple of shlokas my yes, grandma's always like this to quote verses and this is a important point krishna describes a famous verse in the 10th chapter 10th canto of the bhagavatam chapter 88 probably quotes often krishna says yashya hamana gridami harishita dhanam shanita tadutanam dujancha sasvajana dukita that i give my anugraha or my blessing to someone by taking everything away from them now i remember when i first came in touch with that verse i thought to myself that doesn't really make much sense because if krishna's mercy the manifestation of his mercy is that if someone becomes poverty stricken then there's so many drunken bums on the streets of new york mm-hmm. and in mumbai who don't have anything who haven't gotten krishna's mercy it's not just that that someone is poor that they have mercy in the next verse which is not often quoted krishna explains further sayadavatatad yoga nirvina shad dnehaya 
Maparai Krita Maitresha Karishe Madanugraham. Again, he uses the phrase Anugraham. He says, This is Madanugraham. He says, When they lose their money and then everybody deserts them, nobody likes them. And to be really brutally frank, I've seen that in our society sometimes too. Someone comes and they're giving lots of money and everybody gives them the flower garden and they love them, but then they lose their business after some time. And then we no longer care for them. Or they're a brahmachari doing big collection. We love them when they're doing that, but then they get married and they're no longer giving money to the temple. And we say, that guy is a nonsense. He stopped his service and this and this. And we criticize them. So when you lose your money, Krishna's indirect point is in this verse, you can understand who your real friends are. That's who you make. He says, at that time, when, when all your family and the external people leave you, then you make friends with my devotees. And he says, it's by making friends with my devotees that my anugraha is really there, my real mercy. And so when we speak about all these different, uh, different, well, different aspects of preaching and moods amongst the devotees, if they, if they bring people to the point where they actually love devotees and love devotees for being devotees. That's beautiful. If I understand you, what you're saying is that in the, in the institutional context also, you know, who is really caring for us as devotees and who is caring for us as like a human resource for a service. <laughs> <laughs> that we will come to know in times of adversity. <laughs> yeah, that's true. And uh, so, what you were what you were saying previously about uh, is when we practice bhakti, we have to go, like our purpose is to develop our individuality and grow in bhakti, or we could say offer our individuality to Krishna, in a sense. Mm -hmm. So I feel that uh, this itself is a subject which uh, we could maybe in a future discussion discuss about how you know, there are what all forms of developing one's individuality are acceptable within the parameter of bhakti. Say if somebody wants to say that I want to become a rock musician, if somebody says uh, there are various things. Some, if somebody just wants to learn music and sing, that's relatively easy. But there may be some things where developing individuality and practicing bhakti, sometimes it may not be contrary to bhakti, but it may be contrary to the institutional conceptions of bhakti. So that also will need to be considered. So, you know, would you like to maybe speak something Concluding before we move to the next, I don't want to hold you because I told you for one and a half hours. I don't want to hold you for too long. So do you want to speak yeah. any concluding words or I can summarize? Well, just so that I, I, I feel very blessed to be able to have this kind of association and thoughtful discussion. Srila Vishnu Chakrabarti Thakur in his Artha Barshani commentary on the Gita in the 12th chapter, he speaks about three stages to bhakti, abhyasa, manana, and smarana. And in the beginning, abhyasa, yoga, yuktena, we practice. Abhyasa means to practice. And it may be mindless. I'm just sweeping the floor because they told me to sweep the floor. And while I'm sweeping the floor, I'm thinking of my favorite non-devotee movie. Or I'm thinking of my old girlfriend or a favorite song. But something happens after some time of practice, the heart becomes cleansed. And then we become more thoughtful. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this because Prabhupada will be pleased, because the deities will be pleased, because they're persons, because people, when they come, they'll, they'll be so joyous to see how clean and how what a wonderful atmosphere the temple has. So then that, that, all of a sudden, our bhakti is changing gears. And then from that platform of manana will naturally come smarana where we would remember Krishna in a natural way. Krishna comes to our mind in a natural way. It's not so artificial. So these three very philosophical terms, we could also apply in terms of the institution, in terms of the Seva Sangha of Shiva Prabhupada, which I like to think of it. I didn't want to join an institution, but I want to be part of the Seva Sangha of Shiva Prabhupada and be with like-minded, thoughtful devotees like your good self, Prabhuji. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll quickly summarize. We went in many different directions. 
but you started by talking about how yes. as devotees we need a certain level of independence independence so that we can develop our individuality and offer ourselves to krishna and you talked about how as devotees initially a certain amount of discipline is required it's just like somebody goes to a school then they eventually graduate from the school not that they stay eternally in the school so similarly devotees need to learn the principles of bhakti uh, and then see how they can express it in their own lives so as you quoted that the institution is primarily like a prabhupad seva sangha and each one of us has to find out how we can serve the best so some devotees may be able to uh, they may be able to find their individual inspiration for service in a way that harmonizes with the institution's goals some devotees may be happy to be told what to do life long some devotees may not find it, somebody like especially those who are creative and artistic they will need to create the space and the beginning of the space is not so much by say trying to agitate against the movement but actually a call of the heart for krishna and when it begins from there we can move forward and then you made the beautiful example of how the water in a river or a ocean is what keeps is there below the boat for it to float but if that water comes in then it becomes problematic it will sink so like that the institution offers us a means by which we can individually move forward in bhakti and in so some extent organization is required for widespread outreach it's like a packaging for a gift to survive and go far but it's not just to preserve we don't want to spread the package we want to share the gift which is inside the package that's important <laughs> and then within our tradition itself you gave some very significant examples is talk talk actually chaitanya mahaprabhu supported the jagannath puri temple but at the same time had his own space in gambhira and bhakti sanat sri thakur and lalit prasad both of them they had their ways of practicing bhakti and although it was different and institutional level there were differences but they had very friendly relationships and prabhupad also you, you shared several letters two letters primarily of prabhupad to karandar where prabhupad says avoid bureaucracy and what is it isv individual spontaneous and voluntary <laughs> that is beautiful and yes. also <laughs> and it's very beautiful and then you also said that when prabhupad a eh, prabhupad in encourage love trust responsibility and empowerment and if we could actually give people devotee devotee space to grow individually then the institutional conflicts could decrease individual devotees will feel less choked and we as a movement will grow and if sometimes some individual expressions seem to differ from the the way the bhakti is shared in the institution then we need to know that we don't own devotees and different devotees according to their inspiration they may build bridges and it's up to those devotees to take care that you know it's that they don't cross the bridge and stay on the other side but that they create a pathway for people to come on the other side to come toward krishna and you concluded by talking about how sometimes when we are within an institution we may seem to be comfortable but we don't really know who are our well wishers that was a fantastic interpretation explanation of the yasya manugrani viewers that uh, when uh, at that time we come to know who our real friends are and vishwa chakradakur you quoted towards the conclusion so bro this was a very illuminating discussion and uh, i look forward to continuing this in the near future very soon thank you chaitanya thank, 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 thank you very much thank you very inspiration Oh, Prabhu, it's you are an inspiration, and I'm blessed to have your association. Thank you.